good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Celine Galekian, and I will be introducing this session on behalf of AGBU Europe. Uh, we are very pleased to have you all with us tonight for the very first event of our European project entitled IDs and their Consequences, Genocide and International Justice after 1919. This is a project that aims to shed a new light on the legacy of World War I, including the mass atrocities that occurred during that period and the treaties that ended the war, and which will examine the impact of the legacy of this legacy on the history of 20th century Europe. It is a project that is co-funded by the Europe for Citizens program of the European Union, and it is carried out by the Armenian General Benevolent Union, AGBU Europe, um, in partnership with the Lepsius House in Potsdam, with the European Union of Jewish Students, EUJS, and with the Roma organization, Piren Amensa. As I said, this is the very first event of our project that will carry on until the end of this year. We actually have another online event tomorrow evening in partnership with the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris. And we will have later on um, this summer an international conference in Berlin, as well as a series of other events in several European cities, including Cologne, Milano, Valence, and finally Brussels. So we hope you'll be able to follow us until, uh, until then. Uh, but for now, I will leave the floor to Roy uh, Knocke uh, from the Lepsius House, who will be moderating this session. Uh, so thank you again for joining. And Roy, I leave the floor to you. Yeah, thank you, Celine, for the introduction. And good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Lepsius House Potsdam, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. On June 2nd, 1921, exactly 100 years ago today, the trial against the Armenian student, Soko Montelerian, who assassinated the former Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire and chief perpetrator of the Armenian genocide, Mehmet Talat, was opened in Berlin. This trial was turned out in retrospect to be not only a piece of an unbelievable criminal story, but turned into a tribunal on the victims' crimes against humanity as well, and it made legal history. So let me welcome and introduce today's speaker who will shed light on the background of the trial and its impact on the development of international law. Dr. Rolf Hosfeld is the director of the Potsdam Lepsius House. He also works as an independent writer and historian and has been member of the German Writers' Union since 1982. Besides numerous articles, Rolf Hosfeld has published 15 books as author and edited several more. The Social Democratic Friedrich Ebert Foundation awarded him its prize, the political book, in 2010 for his biographical essay on Karl Marx. His comprehensive history of the Armenian genocide was published in 2005. A revised and completed edition has been released in 2015, and there was also a Turkish translation in 2018, and there is an Armenian translation um, forthcoming um, this year or the beginning of the next year. He also published several books on Johannes Lepsius and the German Empire and the Armenian Genocide as editor, co-editor, and contributor. We have about 50 minutes of presentation and afterwards a Q&A session. So all participants will have the opportunity to ask questions to the speaker. And for that, please type in your questions in the chat and I will moderate them to Rolf Hosfeld. So Rolf, the floor is yours. Rolf, du musst dich noch stumm schalten. Uh, aufheben. Okay, thank you very much, Celine. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, as I already said, this is a centenary today, exactly 100 years ago in the morning of uh, June 2, 1921, 
the trial against Sogman Tulirian, who had assassinated Talat Pasha in March, began. And it ended with an acquittal uh, a, day, a day later. So my um, um, lecture will be on the, on the assassination. It will ask who was Talat, who was um, Tulirian. It will ask also why was this trial so extraordinary and what were, was its meaning for the um, um, development of international law and moral views on violence against civilians in the forthcoming time. So let's begin with the assassination. On March 15, 1921, the former Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire, Talat Pasha was shot dead on Berlin's Hardenbergstrasse by the Armenian student Sogoman Tilerian. You can see both on the pictures, Talat, about 47 years old at that time, Sogoman Tilerian, the beginning of his 20s. It was around 11 a.m., a mixed cool day with light showers and occasional flashes of March sun, when a well-aimed shot from a nine millimeter parabellum hit Talat unprepared in the back of the head at close range. A crowd had quickly formed on the side of the street opposite the old Prussian military academy. Excited gesticulating, frightened paralysis, rumors and first audacious theories about the victim and the background of the attack immediately made the rounds while the perpetrator fled headlong into a side street where he was met by people he could not avoid. Sales representative Nicholas Yesen finally managed to catch him. People were beating him like mad Yesen will later testify in court. One gentleman kept hitting him on the brain with a key, people shouted, stop the robber murderer. But what had happened here was no ordinary murder. It was, as it would soon turn out, a political assassination. That's a foreigner. I'm a foreigner too, there's no harm in it. The perpetrator stemmed in broken German when he was finally taken to the police at Berlin's Zoo railway station, still subjected to the blows of spontaneous vigilant justice on the way. Tillerian had not even tried to escape. The assassination of Talat Pasha was really the last act of the tragedy whose earlier scenes were enacted in the blood-stained deserts of Asia Minor, wrote the New York Times two days later. It is not I, who am the murderer, it is he that said the young Armenian, Sogoman Tellurian to the police a moment after firing the fatal shot. Talat Pasha, Tellurian was convinced was among the main perpetrators of the genocide committed by the Ottoman Empire against the Armenians during the First World War. The well-known German Turcophile Ernst Jack organized Talat's funeral. Obituaries were placed in the newspapers, signed Mrs. Talat, the widow of the murdered man sent out invitations to influential personalities and political friends to attend the funeral service, which was to take place on March 19, 21, 11 a.m. at Talat's flat. Afterwards, the coffin of Talat was transferred in a procession to a cemetery. Prominence was there to pay their last respects to the former ally in the World War. Former foreign ministers Richard von Kuhlmann and Arthur Zimmermann were seen alongside a Deutsche Bank executive and the former director of the Baghdad Railway. Various military officers who served on the Turkish side in the Orient during the war appeared, and the Foreign Office had a wrath laid with a dedication to a great statesman and loyal friend. Count Platen attended the funeral service as a representative of the Kaiser who was living in exile in Holland. Originally, 
Talat's political friends had toyed with the idea of having his body repatriated to Turkey, but neither in the occupied Constantinople nor in <clears throat> Mustak Fakema Atatürk Center of National Resistance in Ankara, one wanted to know something of it. Too much reliance was being placed on the goodwill of Great Britain in particular concerning the negotiations currently underway for a revision of the Sèvres Peace Treaty. However, this did not prevent Yunus Nadi, a journalist from the former Grand Vizier's inner political circle who had proclaimed the beginning of an era of cleansing against the Ottoman Armenians in 1916 during the war from publicly praising Talat as Turkey's great revolutionary and reformer in Mustafa Kemal's capital, Ankara. The newspapers in Ankara had used Talat's death to sing his praise in all keys, the German envoy from Constantinople reported to Berlin. Influential Turks very close to Mustafa Kemal's nationalists had given him to understand clearly that Talat remained their hope and idol even after the lost war. On June 2, as I said, 1921, exactly 100 years ago, Tevilian's trial opened at the Moabit District Court. It was a hot summer day, as the newspapers reported. And you can here see the original courtroom. Uh, in, in, uh, at the first day of the trial. Maybe some of you will know this scene from Riverneuil's movie Myrick with Claudia Cardinal and Omar Shari from 1929, where black and white sequence from the trial shows the expectations of Armenian refugees arriving at Marseille Harbor in late spring the same year. International press was present at the courtroom Dark-eyed people with burnishing wishes stood by the murderer observed the Berlin Fossische Zeitung. Not surprisingly, many Armenians from the small Berlin community attended the trial. But Turks were also seen in the hall, among them a widow, the widow of the murdered man. Among the local spectators was the, long, the young law student, Robert M. W. Kempner, who would later become one of the prosecutors at the Nuremberg trial against the Nazis after World War II. At the start of the trial, the defendant was led in, slim, darkly dressed, tall, narrow, finely arched skull of the intellectual, as Fossische Zeitung reported. He was a fine, decent boy, said the witness, Mrs. Dittmann, in whose boarding house on Hardenbergstraße he had been staying when the crime occurred. She described him as a nervous, insecure, often somewhat melancholy person who could give the impression of being troubled by heavy thoughts. Telerian had moved into the room at Mrs. Dittmann's just two weeks before the crime. After he had found out where the whereabout, after he had found out the whereabouts of the former Grand Vizier, as he admitted to the court, he wanted to be able to be constantly near so, him so that he could observe him. From his room on the level of the present day main canteen of the Technical University, he had Talat's house firmly in view when. On the morning of March 15, he saw him step out, hit, out onto his balcony in the light of the spring sun. Something must have excited him so much that the maid heard him crying from outside. <coughs> At that moment, he made up his mind to follow Talat on his foot as soon as he left the house. He took his Luger 08 pistol out of the suitcase in which it was hidden, uh, hidden under the laundry, sank it into the inside pocket of his jacket and waited for the moment when Talat stepped in front of the door. Headlong, he rushed out of the room, leaving, contrary to his habits, 
a half-drunken bottle of French cognac on the table, as Mrs. Didman told the court. A few minutes later, Talat was dead. What had happened here was an assassination that made history and nota bene also legal history. Talat was not a stranger. The fact that he was in Germany after the war was known to interest its circles despite his assumed incognito. Talat got involved in Berlin. He had connections to the highest circles, even if initially in the turbulent revolutionary times of 1918-19, he faced certain hostility from the ranks of some of his compatriots in Berlin. At that time, the Turkish club was under the influence of some young officer candidates who were be being trained at the Naval Academy. They had come into contact with revolutionary sailors there, had been influenced by their ideas of equality and universal human rights, and were now demanding that the, those responsible for the crimes of the World War be held accountable. A book entitled Robber murderers as guests of the German Republic by a certain Mehmet Seki Bey appeared in Berlin, listing a detailed criminal history of the crimes of Talat and his comrades. But Talat had influential friends in Germany from the very beginning who pursued the same goal with him, namely to prevent any so-called fulfillment policy of the provisions of the treaty of Versailles and the following treaties by all conceivable means. In the first place, the issue was war crimes. In early 1920, the British demanded the extradition of Talat, Enver, and other Turks from Germany as war criminals, but the list they submitted also included names such as Hindenburg, Mackensen, Tirpitz, and Ludendorff. In Germany, in Germany, the campaign against extradition had reached a climax at that time and was on the verge of creating an international crisis. It was the sentiment against Versailles that gave Talat and his comrades immunity in Germany from the start. Talat Pasha reported the Berliner Neueste Nachrichten as early as the beginning of 1919 is following closely from here the plans of the English for the partition of the country and the events in Istanbul, which will sooner or later have a decisive effect on the cause of world history in these decisive days, and will then lead such a prominent, prominent personality as the reformer Grand Vizier back to some important position in the council of his sorry tired, tried country. He was by no means willing, a confident reported to the Berlin Foreign Office to accept defeat as something final. When the social philosopher and publicist Ernst Trolch attended a press conference in March 1920 of the cup putschists who were also unwilling to accept defeat as something final and had tried to overthrow the democratically elective government in Berlin with armed formations and swastikas on their helmets. Talat Bey, the experienced master of revolutions, as Church put it, was also there to publicly utter critical words about the dilettantism of the Putsch party. But Talat was not a dilettant, like the short-term dictator Wolfgang Kapp. Through the Italian foreign minister, Count Sforza, who was already pro kemalist at the time, he secured the release of, by the British of young Turk leaders imprisoned in Malta. From Berlin, Talat pulled the strings of the Turkish national movement in Anatolia, dating back to plans he himself had drawn up at the beginning of the war, when it was a question of recognizing, re reorganizing resistance from Asia Minor in the event of a possible occupation of Constantinople. Talat supported 
the later founder of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal, initially hoping to use him as a puppet for his own plans. For a long time, he considered himself as the real leader of the Anatolian movement and even issued specific military instructions to nationalist generals in Anatolia from Berlin. Before and after during the World War, he was considered the leading head of the National Revolutionary Committee for Unity and Progress, CUP, ruling in the Ottoman Empire. According to the judgment of Shukru Hanyoglu, a Turkish historian teaching in the United States, the first ideolo ideologically based one party dictatorship in modern history. He, as Hans Lukas Kieser has pointed out in his worth reading, Talat Pasha biography opened the age of extremes and the Europe of the dictators. Also for this reason, Telerian's attack became an outstanding, if not cathartic event. Moreover, the violence in the blood-stained deserts of the Orient, as the New York Times put it, had for the first time reached European streets. Talat, read the times the day after the assassination apparently feared the fate that now had reached him. The whole world, the left liberal Berliner Tageblatt said the same day knew what for. It was, Tageblatt wrote especially clarified and for all, uh, once and for all by the writings of Dr. Lepsius that the young Turk COP government under Talat's leadership had attempted during the World War to solve the Armenian question once and for all by force. The commentator was referring primarily to the collection of diplomatic files published by Johannes Lepsius in early 1919 under the title Germany and Armenia 1914 to 1918, which would play a prominent role in the trial and which Berliner Tageblatt had commented on the time in the words <clears throat> there is a degree of wretchedness and nefariousness at which the big words become small and every theatrical memory seems insipid. There is a horror that does not bear pathos. Lepsius collection of the files Germany and Armenia was, in addition to his report on the situation of the Armenian people in Turkey, which had been published secretly during the war in 1916 and was reprinted in 1919, first and foremost, the documentation of a previously unimaginable crime against humanity. An Ottoman court martial in Constantinople, nowadays Istanbul, established by the Sultan's decree N233, had also sentenced Dartalas to death in absentia on July 5, 1919, for, among other things, his prominent role in the Armenian massacres of 1915-16. The establishment of this court, before which, according to Chairman Nazim Pasha, in the name of universal human rights, members of a criminal political organization in possession of state power were to be held accountable by a court of their own country was something decidedly unusual for the time. The crimes at issue were called crimes against humanity by the Ottoman prosecutor in no uncertain terms during the opening session. He thus adopted a term that has been used since the beginning of the 20th century and that remained valid until Raphael Lemkin replaced it in 1944 with the term genocide which was more precise for crimes of this kind. The Istanbul verdict still had the status of legal validity at the time of the Berlin assassination before it was to be overturned in 1922 by the victorious national government of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. For German politics, the assassination meant a delicate matter. As before, uh, as before, the issue of war guilt dominated the international debate. In Britain, 
The opinion was slowly gaining ground that Germany had probably not deliberately brought about the war after all, when in response to an article by historian Hans Delbrück in the Contemporary Review, suddenly, just a few days before the assassination of Tarnat, an entirely different issue was raised there. Germans, Germany's culpability for its Turkish policies during the war. Once again, Telerian's pistol shot had made it public that the German Republic was harboring wanted Turkish war criminals, and the danger was great that the German government's role during the Armenian genocide might come up publicly at this trial. Moreover, the dispute with Poland over the Upper Silesian territories dominated politics during this period. The trial was highly inconvenient. Originally, the defense had requested a three, at least three days of a trial in order to shed light on the motives behind Talat's Telerian's actions, which were rooted in the person and in the crimes of the victim. However, political pressure meant that the trial was ultimately limited to two days. According to the Foreign Office, they wanted to avoid at all costs that the trial would turn into a political mammoth case and that the whole question of the Armenian atrocities already unpleasantly known from the war would be brought up by discussion again, which in view of the unresolved Upper Silesian question could lead to highly undesirable international reactions. Not least, the murder of Talat Pasha took place at a time when the Leipzig war crimin crimes trials were begin being opened. Against this background too, it becomes clear why the Foreign Office had reservations if in the course of the trial, the general political role of Talat Pasha and his position in Germany to Germany with regard to Germany were to be discussed in greater detail, but this could hardly be avoided. The trial, which began in the morning of June 2, 1921, at the Berlin-Morbid Regional Court ended, surprisingly for many, with an acquittal. In the eyes of the jury, the spectators and the press, the trial had in fact, in fact become, through the skill of the defense attorneys and expert witnesses, a trial about the deeds of the victim. In this atmosphere, the defense had succeeded in pleading that the defendant had limited freedom of will at the time of the crime. The no vote of the foreman of the jury, Otto Reinecke, on the question of Terurian's guilt had been un un unanimous. Tillerian was able to leave the Moabit district court embraced and can congratulated by compatriots as a free man. Although Tillerian's defense pleaded temporary insanity, the New York Times commented on this surprising outcome, his real defense was the horrific past of Talat Pasha, making the Armenians acquittal of the charge of murder in German terms, a death sentence for the Turk. It was this internal dialectics that made the June 1921 criminal trial one of the most memorable, memorable, memorable trials ever held in Germany, in the words of Stefan Erich, even one of the most spectacular trials, trials of the 20th century. Public perception focused primarily on the motives of the perpetrator, consequently, on the crimes of the victim, the genocide of more than a million Ottoman Armenians. Hannah Arendt mentions the assassination and the trial in her book Eichmann in Jerusalem for this reason as a kind of prehistory. In memory, especially of Armenians, the assassination is considered first and foremost a crime of vengeance, according to the formulations of one of its 
its chronicles Edward Alexander. But in reality, it was about much more. Even the timing of the assassination followed a precise and calculated political agenda. As a result of war with Turkey, the Armenian borders, regardless of the far-reaching provisions of the Treaty of Sèvres from August 10, 1920, were unilaterally established by Turkish dictate on December 2, 1920. Nine days later, the formerly Russian parts of Armenia provisionally, provisionally experienced, experienced de facto Sovietization and thus, especially after the conclusion of a treaty of friendship between Russia, Soviet Russia and Mustafa Kemal's Turkey in March 16, on March 16, 1921, lost any possibility of independently asserting its interest at the international level. In this situation for which, as the German Social Democratic Daily Forwards speculated, a deep disappointment with the post-war policy of the Entente was also played a role. The assassination was not only to be an act of retaliation. It was intended above all through the ensuing trial, according to Shah Natalie, one of the organizers of the attack, operating in the background, to effectively bring the Armenian cause and the Armenian desire for justice to international attention. According to Hannah Arendt's judgment, the trial was at least as important as the assassination itself. It did not resolve the tension between justness and justice, but it did make it publicly visible in part through the unpredictable drama of a criminal trial. As a companion wrote to Natalie on July 21, 1921, this one bullet and the trial did in three to four months for the popularization of our question as much as it was not possible to obtain during the last 10 years and after spending 10 million. Now we must benefit from this to keep it alive. Varan Sakarians to Shah Natalie, July 1921-1921. Zolman was born in 1896 in the village of Pakariji and on the border between Azorum and Trapezund or Trapezund provinces, where he received an elementary education. He continued his education at the Protestant high school and the Armenian San Nazarian College of Ersinjan, graduating in 1912. In 1913, he went to Serbia. Although he planned to study in Germany, he traveled to Tbilisi after the outbreak of World War I and there joined the Armenian voluntary, Volunteer Corps of legendary Federal Commander Andarnik Ozanyan, operating on the Russian side. The genocide profoundly affected his life, especially when he visited his, his childhood home in Asinjan after the Russian conquest of parts of Eastern Anatolia in 1916. The once 20,000 Armenians of the town had disappeared, except of a few isolated fugitives who managed to hide in the mountains. However, Telerian was not the personally involved victim. He presented himself as in court through intensive preparation and with extreme concentration. During the trial, he painted an extraordinary credible picture of the massacres in Asinjan to which his entire family had fallen victim and which seemed even more credible when compared with other testimonies from the region. In fact, his family had perished, but he himself was on the Russian side of the front at the time. He received the order to assassinate Talat Pasha in fall of 1920 in the Boston restaurant Coco, 
before setting out from there to Berlin. The client was the former Ottoman member of parliament from Ersinjan and politician of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Dashnak Tsutyun Amangaro, who resided in the USA after the war as ambassador of the short-lived Republic of Armenia and now headed the Armenian secret organization, Nemesis. Had Tellurian's intent been known to the court, he could never have gotten away with it. The theologian and human rights activist, Johannes Lepsius, you see him here in a photo about the time, the beginning of the 1920s, was the actual backstage organizer of the Tellurian's of Tellurian defense for which 100,000 German marks, according to some sources, more than 300,000 marks, were raised on the part of the Dashnak Zutjun for the attention of Lepsius' close associates, Vahan Zakarians and Liparit Nazarians. Both belonged to the Dashnak Zutjun. Nazarians had also been a founding member of Lepsius' German Armenian Society in June 1914, had reconnoitered the incipient massacres in Turkey in the spring of 1915 with the support of the German Foreign Office, which had issued him, him a fake passport under a false name and was now acting as vice consul of the Republic of Armenia in Berlin. Our German friends, Garo wrote in a letter at the end of May 1921 referring to Lepsius, have a firm intention to make this trial a forum for our cause. In according with Lepsius' intention, therefore, the main task of the defenders was to prove that Talat was primarily responsible for the deportations and massacres. Implicit in this was the ambitious goal of transforming a criminal trial into a political trial for public perception by focusing on the motives of the perpetrator and such the deeds of the victim. Three high profile figures took on Tellurian's defense. The Privy Councillor of Justice, Adolf von Gordon, had made a name for himself as a joint plaintiff in sensational trials, such as the case, the case of Kuno Count Moltke against Maximilian Hahn in 1907, in the context of the so-called Eulenburg scandal, which involved homosexuality and favoritism in the Kaiser's inner circle, and in the case of Matthias Erzberger against Karl Helferich, who was a right-wing radical who tried to destroy the career of the Democrat Erzberger with trumped up charges in 1920. Natalie described Gordon as conservative, but very influential. Counselor of Justice, Johannes Werthauer, a friend of Charlie Chaplin, among, among others, was one of the outstanding lawyers of the Weimar Republic who was stripped of his citizenship by the Nazis in August 1933 on their first list. His Berlin office was taken over by the Nazi jurist Oswald Freisler, a brother of the later notorious president of the People's Court, Roland Freisler. In addition to his work as honorary consul for Yugoslavia, he was committed to reforms in sexual criminal law, including, including the area of abortion and the so-called homosexual paragraph 175. In 1919, he defended the leftist and pacifist writer and publicist Kurt Tucholsky in the case of an anti-militarist poem for which he had been accused by the Reichswehr ministry. Secret Councillor Theodor Niemeyer, a man of European reputation, was a co-founder of the International Law Association and a member of the Institut de Droit International which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1904. In 1915, he found, founded the Journal of International Law. In 1917, 
on Niemeyer's initiative, the German Society for International Law was founded, which was forcibly dissolved in 1933 after Hitler's National Socialists seized power. Everything had been done, Lepsius told a Danish friend at the beginning of April 1921 to put the defense in the hands of the first lawyers and to equip them with all necessary material. He himself had spoken to the public prosecutor as well as mobilized the press. Indeed, in addition to German dailies, the New York Times, the Chicago Daily News, the Philadelphia Public Ledger and the London uh, Daily Telegraph, among others, reported extensively on the case. The preparation was so good that just a few days after the assassination, Werthauer expressed the certainty that he had not the slightest doubt that the trial would end with an acquittal for the assassin. On the Armenian side, however, Shah Natali assumed that the formalities of German criminal law would certainly lead to a conviction, but that a subsequent pardon by the social democratic German president, Friedrich Ebert, was likely. This was also in line with the calculations of the lead prosecutor, Golnik, who was, moreover, familiar with the matter in so far as two close relatives had cared for Armenian orphans in Smyrna, today's Izmir, as deaconesses. Lepsius, however, advised against appealing to President Ebert before the jury verdict because he was convinced that the defense attorneys would succeed in pleading that the crime had been committed in the heat of the moment or under compelling suggestion. Telerian had indeed been under treatment for some time for psychasthenic effective epileptic seizures by Professor Richard Cassira of the Berlin Charité Mental Hospital. The diagnosis established a high probability of periodically re recurring temporary insanity of the defendant, which in case of doubt could justify an acquittal according to paragraph 51 of the German Penal Code. In fact, this was the outcome of the trial, although the uh, persecution had pleaded murder under, under paragraph 211 and considered the facts of intent proven. According to the opening decision, Tillerian was charged with intentionally killing the former Grand Vizier Tana Pasha and carrying out the killing with deliberation. Tillerian denied the question of premediation, saying, I killed a man, but I was not a murderer, but admitted the factuality of the crime. Other witnesses confirmed the latter facts, characterized traits of his personality, and provided insights into the cause of the crime. However, the trial was mainly determined by the question of Tillerian's motives, his experiences during the World War and his psychological condition during the crime. Even before the reading of the opening order, the presiding judge Lehmberg asked Tillerian against the resistance of the prosecution which wanted to see the trial limited to the narrower legal facts of the crime about the antecedents of this crime. The defendant gave a detailed account of the massacre of his family and his alleged survival. This was unusual, but Lindberg, intensively familiar with Lepsius' correction of documents, Germany and Armenia, obviously wanted to strike a main chord with it which unconsciously already at the beginning gave Delirian's statement, a murderer, I have not been, a certain credibility. The core of his narrative about the extermination of his family was in general known to Lehmberg through Lepsius' collection of documents which contained comparable descriptions of massacre events. The same applies to the testimony of the witness the witness, Christine Terzibajan, 
who was actually deported with her family from Erzurum in July 1915 and was among the few survivors. The crucial phase of the trial, however, according to the New York Times, began when Lepsius produced official Turkish documents proving that the leaders of the Turkish government in Constantinople, and especially Talat himself, were directly responsible for turning the deportations into a bloodbath. His export report basically summarized once again what was known from his publications. He emphasized the intentionally planned character, character of the deportations and massacres carried out with administrative precision, characterized the young Turk CUP ideology as pan-Turkish and xenophobic with a clear side reference to the domestic anti-Semitic pan-German movement and characterized Talat as the main culprit referring among other things to the Istanbul court martial hearings. Literally, the proceedings of the court martial in Constantinople bring proof that the deportation was decided by the Young Turk Committee and that Talat Pasha, the soul of the committee and its strongest man, ordered the extermination and did nothing to lessen its horrors. This can be proved on the basis of German and Turkish documents. Lepsius had originally wanted to use as evidence to corroborate his presentation a series of dispatches in which Talat gave specific instructions as part of his extermination policy and had the source of these documents, the journalist Aram Andonian summoned as a witness by the defense from Paris. However, neither the defense request to, re to read out the dispatches, nor the defendant's request to summon Andonian as a witness in the courtroom was granted. Only rudimentarily cited by the defense and by Lepsius during the trial, these documents were nevertheless before the court and were also available to the press. The New York Times quoted them at length. They contained instructions to the Aleppo Deportation Center with direct and sometimes detailed extermination orders from 1915 and 1916 and were all signed Talat. The authenticity of these documents has long been disputed among historians, but it has recently been confirmed by the meticulous research of historian Tana Akchan, who teaches in Massachusetts. Uh, Lepsios, for his part, had them already verified by the former German consul in Aleppo, Walter Rosler, who came to the conclusion that, based on his knowledge on the situation on the ground, the whole thing made an extremely credible impression on him. However, Rösler's appearance as a witness was subject to approval by the Foreign Office. In his sworn testimony before the court, he could not help, as he told to his, his superiors, but to express my conviction that Talat is indeed one of those Turkish statesmen who wanted and planned the extermination of the Armenians. Um, his authority, superior authority, then after this withdrew its originally granted permission to testify on the evening before the trial began. A relevant telegram, which contained a personally signed killing all about Tanat, was nevertheless presented to the court by the witness Krikoris Balakian, while the expert Liman von Sanders, who according to his war memories, never saw, saw through the complicated power structure of the COP state, did not come to a clear verdict. But he also did not claim that Talat would be innocent. Von Sanders, who had been chief of the German military mission in the Orient, in the Ottoman Empire, 
since June 1913 had saved the Armenians of Smyrna from deportation in the fall of 1916 under threat of military force, supported in this matter by the chief of staff of the 5th Ottoman Army, Colonel Kiasim Bey, who was subordinate to him. The trial made legal history. In conventional terms, the defense lawyers were required to plead for paragraph 51, but they made extensive use of the, the, the tribunal's gallery beyond that as a forum for further elaboration. Johannes Werthauer questioned the perversions of nationalist militarism and its propensity for fundamentally violent solutions to conflict, portraying Tellerian in his discourse scheme as someone who took up the revolver in order to represent, as it were, the spirit of justice against the principle of violence. Not only did he address the limits of legitimate violence against the background of the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, he portrayed Tillerian as an Armenian William Tell, who is, who does know, the Swiss national hero and freedom fighter, also popular in Germany, who was said to have assassinated the Habsburg governor Gessler in the early 14th century. Your verdict will probably be heeded after thousand years of, uh, um, thousands of years for these <coughs> wild crimes. That I put it to the jury in his impassioned closing argument. What jury in the whole world would have assassinated, would have convicted William Tell of shooting down the oppressor? His colleague Niemeyer went a step further. The trial here is not like any other, Niemeyer said in his closing argument. It goes beyond the scope of this courtroom by itself and forces us to turn our eyes to wider contexts. And please let me see the text. We are compelled to exercise that jurisdiction of District Court 3 and of this jury in the sense of a, world, of a wide ranging and enlightened knowledge of the nature of law and the tasks of humanity and its interrelationships. And if this is done, I do not believe you will find Zogomotelirian guilty of death. Nehemiah in his plea at the court on the last day, June 3, 1921. Through Niemeyer, and to some extent already through Werthauer, a component of natural law was included in a criminal trial that was unusual, especially in light of the dominant role of legal positivism in German, German judicial culture. Niemeyer and Werthauer thus addressed, addressed nothing other than the unresolved tension between justness and justice cited by Hannah Arendt and implicitly called for consequences for future international criminal law. The young trial observer, Robert M. W. Kempner, I've mentioned him at the beginning, was more explicit. He would later emigrate to the United States as a persecuted Jew and become internationally known during the course of the Nuremberg war crimes trials as deputy to the American chief prosecutor, Robert H. Jackson. During this time, Kempner found, among other things, the so-called Once Protocol, in which the planned organization of the so-called final solution of the Jewish question was recorded in writing. But already during the trial of Tillerian, he was confronted with the problem area that would occupy him in Nuremberg after 1945. Tillerian's pistol shot in the following trial, he wrote in retrospect, presented the world for the first time with a dilemma of international law in which it had found itself during the First World War. 
He asked himself retrospectively whether, quotation, gross violence, violations of human rights, especially genocide committed by a government, might not well be opposed by foreign states and not constitute undue in interference in the internal affairs of another. For a legal historical appreciation of the Berlin trial, however, its effect on Raphael Lemkin is of most lasting relevance. Legal and justice was no solution, Lemkin, who had read about the assassination in the trial in the newspaper as a young student in Lvov, then Eastern Poland, wrote in his autobiographical notes about the complex dialectics of this outstanding trial. The court in Berlin acquitted Teleria. I decided that he had acted under, it decided that he had acted under psychological compassion. Tenerian, who upheld the moral order of mankind, was classified as insane, incapable of discerning the moral nature of his act. He had acted as the self-appointed legal officer for the conscience of mankind. But can a man appoint himself to meet out justice? Will not passion sway such form of justice and make a travesty out of it? At that moment, my worries about the murder of the innocent became more meaningful, meaningful to me. I didn't know all the answers, but I felt that the law against this type of racial or religious murder must be adopted by the world. Lemkin repeated this thought again with reference to uh, the Tellurian trial in a CBS interview in 1949. Five years later, earlier, five years earlier, Lemkin, at that time a honorary professor of international law at Yale, had published his famous treatise on the occupation policy of the Axis powers in Europe, in which, and in the 1909th chapter, he made the first attempt at, at a legally sound definition of the term genocide. On December 9, 1948, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted Res Resolution 260A3 on this basis, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It seems to me especially important that Lemkin, by seeking to find a single legal definition for historically high diverse forms of genocide, opened up a comp Paratist discourse from the very beginning, long before this paradigm became established in historical scholarship as well. As early as 1933, at a legal conference of the League of Nations in Madrid, he tried to impose generally in binding international rules on the prosecution of mass murder of people because of their religious, ethnic, or social origin by their own states. Lemkin was a deputy prosecutor in Waso at the time, and his activities in his own country were anything but uncontroversial. Josef Beck, the Polish foreign minister, personally forbade him to make a planned, his planned appearance in Madrid. When Lemkin's plan was nevertheless presented there, the German delegates, Hitler had recently become into power, Left the, left the room in protest. A year later, Lemkin gave up and worked as a lawyer until he fled via Sweden to the USA after the German invasion of Poland in 1993. Yet again and again, even after the Shoah, in which 49 members of his family fell victim, Lemkin returned to his initial experience Precisely that memorable trial in Berlin, 1921, the genocide of the Armenians during the First World War and the defiances of international law that had become apparent as a result. Thank you for listening.
Yeah, Rolf, thank you very much for this compelling and very detailed um, uh, story of this trial. And as I mentioned before, um, all participants, the audience um, now have the opportunity to ask questions um, to the speaker. And for that, uh, please type in your question um, in the chat or in this uh, Q&A uh, session, um, uh, Q&A option, which you find um, in the toolbar uh, down to this things. Okay, we have a question, Albrecht Schröter. Um, how does the official historiogra historiography in today's Turkey assess the process? I don't think it plays it plays any mean, meaningful role. Even the the, the 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 trials which took place in um, Istanbul or Constantinople 19, 1920 are not really mentioned. But um, following up, but, I mean, in in Turkish public opinion. Uh, it's the story is that Talat was killed, and the Germans were helping the killer. Yeah, yeah, but but following up this question, Rolf, I mean, maybe not the trial itself in in Turkey today, but how about um, some let's say perspective, Turkish perspective, a positive perspective. Um, uh, on the uh, on on the on Talat, so that Talat was killed, and then he was somehow, let's say, uh, and the trial was not not very righteous. La, la, is this is this kind of historiography in today's Turkey relevant? No, no. It's, it's I mean, some right wing people they say that the the Germans owe us something because they 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 acquitted a murderer. Yeah, but it's normally it's, it's silenced. It's it's simply silenced. Not Talat. I mean, Talat is still an important person for Turkish history, and there are schools and streets named after him. Okay. And and I mean, he his grave is he has still a, a grave uh, together with with a war minister Enver Pasha on the so-called Hill of Freedom in in Istanbul. And his bones were brought there from Berlin in 1943 with the support of the German ambassador in Ankara those days, Franz von Papen. And uh, so he has, has been repatriated mm -hmm. in, during the Nazi times in, in Turkey. Okay, thanks. Um, there was a question by Carla Garapidian. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, were the telegrams ever found after the trial? There has been a mystery about what happened to them. I think that I which, think that which, refers which, to the which, telegrams. Which, I think which, that uh, refers to the telegrams about the deportations. If I no, 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 I mean, yeah, the Turkish telegrams. That's a, a question. I mean, you mean the telegrams, the Talat Pasha telegrams? Yeah, I think she she means that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they were published by 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 um, Andonian in Paris, and and um, and they were also published in German uh, after the trial. So they are not not uh, they, 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 the only question is they are fakes or if they are really can be trusted. This is but the the the, the um, telegrams which they have been dealing with in these times. They did exist, and as I said, the New York Times also printed most of them in detail. Um, and 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 the book of um, Andonian, where they are um, 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 to, to be found, uh, does is also existing. I mean, it's it's this is not the question. The question is were they forgeries or were they originals? And and the the answer of I mean, Dan Akram has made a meticulous research on it. I don't cannot judge if this is. Correct or not, but I, I know from 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 what I know from the German um, uh, documents that there's a high probability that many of these documents are no forgeries. This is at least the opinion of the former consul in uh, Aleppo, Walter Wessler, who knew all these people who have been uh, the uh, the ones who these uh, documents, uh, these these telegrams have been addressed to. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks. There's a question by Nicola Tavitian. Um, can you give us an idea of the press coverage of the trial in Germany and abroad? Well, so how, how, to what extent um, this press coverage um, uh, went through? Yeah, yeah, I mean, as I said, the New York Times intensively reported on this, also other um, 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 American newspapers and also the German press. There's a wide uh, presentation of the, these, of, the, of the two days of the, of the trial. Sometimes in these times, I mean, we had newspapers um, published in the morning and in the evening. So there were two uh, stories on one day uh, in the same newspaper. So, so the, the, the press coverage was impressively. You can, it's, it's also, I mean, it's, it's, this is also mentioned in the book of, Stefan Erich justifying genocide, who um, who um, 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 cites some of these um, press articles. Yeah, and there is there is also uh, several collections in English and also in German, in German, which uh, uh, have collected these kind of yeah, yeah, articles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, not a question, but a statement by Albrecht Schröter. Um, it is great and eminently important that and how um, Rolf Hostfeld and the Lepsius House campaign for the coming to terms with and not forgetting the genocide of the Armenian people. Thanks. Nice. Um, I think we can uh, agree with that. Um, more questions. Take your time. Um, I have one, Rolf. Um, yeah. The assassination of, uh, of Talat was an act that went under the code name Operation Nemesis. And you mentioned that briefly in your presentation. Could you tell us a little bit more about this operation? What do we know um, today about it? Well, I mean, Operation Nemesis was not um, um, limited to Talat. I mean, there were other assassinations following. Okay. In, in Berlin, two years later, um, Bahadin Shakia, who was the the commander of the special organization who was mostly responsible for the massacres during the genocide was also killed um, in, in, in Charlottenburg uh, alongside with Jemal Azmi, the former governor of, of um, um, uh, Trabzon. And there were others in, in, in Rome, Tbilisi and so on. So this was, of course, um, an organization was, which was established by Dashnaks as a secret organization with the aim of um, revenge and, and of, um, um, uh, you know, coming to justice in terms of, of killing the response. The people. But the, the Talat thing is very special because um, in, in the case of Talat, it, it was part of the strategy uh, to have a trial. Mm -hmm. and it, I mean, they had, there were other trials as well, but this was the most important trial. And, and the trial was at least as important as the, the, the assassination itself. And it was important for Nemesis to, to begin with Talat. It was the, the number one on a list of others. And, and, and it was the trial, which indeed had as, as a result that internationally, the question of the Armenian genocide and also the question of justice in cases like this was discussed again on a broad level. And this was not, not in the same way the case with the other assassinations. Mm -hmm. Also, not with the assassination of Shaki and, and Asmi. In this time, there was not such a big public discussion as it was in this case, because there was this trial, which uh, which attended the um, uh, uh, interest of the uh, public um, opinion and the press. Yeah. So this is mainly mainly the reason. Uh, the reason is mainly. 
because Talat was, let's say, more known. Um, yeah, but he was the chief. Ones, he was he was the main responsible person, and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, in not in the eyes of Nemesis, of course, he was the main responsible person. But uh -huh. in the eyes of historians, we could also say that he was the main responsible person. And uh, it's also, I mean, it, if you look at the documents which uh, which the, the the court had um, had on its desk, uh, I mean, the documents from from Lepsius. Uh, drawn from the, the the archives of the Foreign Office. Also there, you could read the judgment of German German ambassadors like Wolf Metternich that Talat was the soul of the Armenian massacres, and uh, and he was of course the the main the main responsible person. Okay, thanks. So there's another question by Stefano Serapian. Um, we know Hitler uttered the infamous genocide quote in one of his speeches. Um, so remembering the Armenians, you know this. Uh, uh, but aside from that, did Hitler ever comment in any way on the acquittal of Tellerian? Do you know any? No, he did not, but his chief ideologue Rosenberg did. Yeah, OK. Uh, his chief ideologue Rosenberg, he, in 1925, he wrote a longer article about this. Uh, this this um, uh, um, assassination in the trial, and for him it was something like which only Armenians and Jews could do. I mean, this is, you know, in the way he, he, he interesting to say to to Hitler is, I mean, what what you have in mind is probably the the quotation from 1993 39 when Hitler said. Uh, who, who th still thinks about the extermination yeah, of the Armenians exactly, before, yeah. before the Germans uh, began the war with Poland. But interestingly, there's another quote, which I think is more to the core of the, of the, of the question. In, in his trial in 1924 at the People's Court in Munich after the Hitler putsch in, from, from, from fall in 1923, Hitler, uh, mentioned Enver Pasha as somebody to follow because Enver Pasha was the war minister of the um, and, uh, and a close associate of Talat Pasha. Um, Enver Pasha to follow because the Young Turks were successful in detoxifying their country. Detoxifying means ethnic purification. So. He had an idea what happened there. That it was a genocide that aimed at the homogenization on the grounds of nation, nationalist ideology. Yeah. So um, uh, for this uh, kind of a subject, um, you mentioned Stefan Erik's book, um, Justifying Genocide. So this is, uh, this is quite um, an interesting read on it. So we have another uh, question by Johannes Altun Kaya. What do we know about Tillerian's life after the trial? After well, the, he was acquitted. He was acquitted. It was rather unspectacular. I mean, he died at, in, in the USA. But he had no public appearances again. I mean, it was honestly to say, I cannot tell you what he exactly did. Yeah. I, I mean, what, what I know is that, I mean, there was, uh, I, I, got, I think he got, uh, he had children and one of his, I think, um, uh, sons, he published um, a memory. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's yeah, true. Yeah. That's so, true. But, but there was no public, uh, public appearance or, or something, something else. So there's another question about the source material, Rolf, um, by Elisabeth Herisch. She asks, where, where do we find the materials um, uh, about this process you mentioned? Yeah, well, th there exists a transcript, literary transcript. And I don't know the English word for it. In Germany, you say stenography. It's, it's, you know, it's exactly, uh, you can exactly read what 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 uh, what 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 has been uh, uh, said at the trial this was published by the german armenian society 
short after the trial in some thousand um, copies with a foreword by Amin T. Wegner and was also translated into some other languages among this Armenian. So you can, I mean, the, this, this gives you an exact um, 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 insight in what happened in these two days before the court. And of course, for the other things, you have to go into, into the archives. You have to go into the archives, mainly into the archives of the Foreign Office um, in, the, in, the, in Germany, in Berlin. And in, in our archive in the Lepsius House, we have those things which relate to Lepsius and his activities. Whereas to the activities of the, the Dashnaks, it's not as, as easy, but there are some, some books published which ex more or less extensively quote letters from that time and which have been found in private um, heritages. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, 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 the archives of the Dashnaks themselves are not available for the public. But to reconstruct it in the way as I did it, I think it's, it's enough to have you have the Foreign Office in Berlin and the, the, the uh, uh, archives in our house. Yeah, and, and I think this, um, uh, this uh, typoscript um, of the trial um, was republished, I think, in the 90s or so. Reprinted. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but I think you, you cannot buy it uh, right now um, as a new book, but maybe as, a, as an antique. Or, or you come, uh, Elizabeth Harris, you just write an email and then uh, visit the Lepsos House and the archive to work on it. Or maybe it's, maybe it's also online, I don't know. You can, yeah. 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 So there's a, there's a, a comment, um, which is quite interesting by Ara Zarafian. Um, Tellerian wrote, wrote his memoir, which will be published in English translation this August by Gomidas Institute London. So, so I said, congratulations, Ara. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I think when it's published, we should think about doing something to promote it. I think so too. Um, any more questions? Um, no. Okay, maybe maybe one question for me, Rolf. Um, uh, you you talked about um, Talat um, in your presentation, and we know that he fled the Ottoman Empire um, in a nocturnal action and with German help, and then he made his way to Berlin. And as you mentioned, he was able to live largely unmolested on Hardenbergstraße. So why did the Germans help him? Yeah, well, as I said, I mean, it, it was the it was the question of the the, the British wanted the Germans to 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 um, to give them the war criminals, but if they would have given him Tala, they would have also have to give him Ludendorff. So they did not do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I mean, yeah, this is. No, one, one does not, I mean, it, it, this is, this is, I think, it's a simple basic reason. But of course, I think Talat still had some support from people who estimated him, some people who uh, thought that the way he was dealing with resistance in Anatolia could be something where the Germans could learn something from. Ultimately, they very much interested in what the Kemalists did. You can read in Stefan Erich's books, but in the very early days, it was not so much Kemal, it was more Talat who was in the focus. And he, he had this idea of resistance in Anatolia in, in, in the case uh, Constantinople would be occupied. This came from already from 1915, when there was uh, the danger that, that this could happen. Um, and in this case, they would have been on retreat to the interior and uh, starting starting resistance from there. And all the plans that have been developed in that time, in the early years of the First World War, then came into existence after the war in the so-called national movement. Mm -hmm. So this was, of course, an idea of Talat and his, his circle. 
and not so much of Kemal because Kemal came later. Okay, any more questions or comments? So if there are no more questions, um, I will conclude this webinar. Um, thank you, Rolf, um, for this presentation and to all of you participating and asking questions um, in this uh, lecture. And let me share with you the upcoming events of our project, Ideas and Consequences, Genocide and International, International Justice after 1919. Um, you can find further information in the chat. So tomorrow there will be a webinar with uh, the already mentioned historian um, Stefan Erik on the original sin of Europe's dark 20th century, reintegrating the Armenian genocide into European and world history. So you have to register for this. Um, you find the link um, in the chat. Um, this is in collaboration um, with the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris and uh, Paris. And in, from August 28 to 29, um, there will be a conference in, a, in Berlin, but also online on the topic of genocide, mass violence, and international justice after 1919. So we try to connect with these um, aspects Rolf uh, mentioned um, in his presentation uh, today in, in a much more larger picture. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf, the audience again, and um, have a nice evening and thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you um, during our next events. Tomorrow. Goodbye.